and we're back with chapter four of Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. Levine, I don't know. I should really figure that out. Anyway, here's chapter four. My mouth opened automatically. The spoon descended and a hot, but not burning, swallow poured in. Mandy had gotten the carrots at their sweetest, carrotiest best. Weaving in and out of the carrots were other flavors, lemon, turtle broth, and a spice I couldn't name. The best carrot soup in the world. Magical soup that nobody but Mandy could make. The rug. The soup. This was fairy soup! Mandy was a fairy! But if Mandy was a fairy, why was Mother dead? You're not a fairy. Why not? If you were, you would have saved her. Oh, sweetie, I would have if I could. If she'd left the hair in my curing soup, she'd be well today. You knew? Why'd you let her? I didn't know till she was too sick. We can't stop dying. I collapsed on the stool next to the stove, sobbing so hard I couldn't catch my breath. Then Mandy's arms were around me, and I was crying into the ruffles along the neck of her apron, where I had cried so many times before for smaller reasons. A drop landed on my finger. Mandy was crying, too. Her face was red and blotchy. I was her fairy godmother, too, Mandy said. And your grandmother's. She blew her nose. I pushed out of Mandy's arms for a new look at her. She couldn't be a fairy. Fairies were thin and young and beautiful. Mandy was as tall as a fairy was supposed to be, but who ever heard of a fairy with frizzy gray hair and two chins? Show me, I demanded. Show you what? That you're a fairy, disappear or something. I don't have to show you anything. And, with the exception of Lucinda, fairies never disappear when other creatures are present. Can you? We can, but we don't. Lucinda is the only one who's rude enough and stupid enough. Why is it stupid? Because it lets people know you're a fairy. She started to wash the dishes. Help me. Do Nathan and Bertha know? I carried plates to the sink. Know what? That you're a fairy. Oh, that again. No one knows but you, and you'd better keep it a secret. Mandy looked her fiercest. Why? She just scowled. I will, I promise, but why? Well, I'll tell you. People only like the idea of fairies. When they bump up against a particular real as corn fairy, they're all, there's always trouble. She rinsed a platter. You dry. Why? Because the dishes are wet, that's why. She saw my surprised face. Oh, why is there trouble? Well, two reasons mostly. People know we can do magic, so they want us to solve their problems for them. When we don't, they get mad. The other reason is we're immortal. That gets them mad, too. Lady wouldn't speak to me for a week when her father died. Why doesn't Lucinda care if people know she's a fairy? She likes them to know, the fool. She wants them to thank her when she gives them one of her awful gifts. Are they always awful? Always. They are always awful. But some people are delighted to have a present from a fairy, even if it makes them miserable. Well, why did Mother know you're a fairy? Why do I know? All the Eleanor line are friends of the fairies. You have fairy blood in you. Fairy blood? Can I do magic? Shall I live forever? Would mother have if she hadn't gotten sick? Are there many friends of the fairies? Very few. You're the only one left in Curia. And no, love, you can't do magic or live forever. It's just a drop of fairy blood. But there's one way it has already started to show. Your feet haven't grown for a few years, I'll warrant. None of me has grown for a few years. The rest of you will grow soon enough, but you'll have fairy feet like your mother did. Mandy lifted the hems of her skirt and five petticoats to reveal feet that were no longer than mine. 
We're too tall for our feet. It's the only thing we can't change by magic. Our men stuff their shoes so no one can tell, and we ladies hide them under our skirts. I stuck a foot out of my gown. Tiny feet were fashionable, but would they make me even clumsier as I grew taller? Would I be able to keep my balance? Could you make my feet grow if you wanted to? Or... I searched for another miracle. Rain pelted the window. Or could you stop the rain? Mandy nodded. Do it, please do it. Why would I want to? For me, I want to see magic, big magic. We don't do big magic. Lucinda's the only one. It's too dangerous. What's dangerous about ending a storm? Maybe nothing, maybe something. Use your imagination. Clear skies would be good. People could go outside. Use your imagination, Mandy repeated. I thought. The grass needs rain. The crops need rain. More, Mandy said. Maybe a bandit was going to rob someone, and he isn't doing it because of the weather? That's right. Or maybe I'd start a drought, and then I'd have to fix that because I started it. And then maybe the rain I sent would knock down a branch and smash in the roof of a house, and I'd have to fix that, too. That wouldn't be your fault. The owners should have built a stronger roof. Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe I'd cause a flood and people would be killed. That's the problem with big magic. I only do little magic. Good cooking, my curing soup, my tonic. When Lucinda cast the spell on me, was that big magic? Of course it was, the nubskull. Mandy scoured a pot so hard that it clattered and banged against the copper sink. Tell me how to break the spell, please, Mandy. I don't know how. I only know it can be done. If I told Lucinda how terrible it is, would she lift the spell, do you think? I doubt it, but maybe. Then again, she might take away one spell and give you another even worse. The trouble with Lucinda is ideas pop into her head and come out as spells. What does she look like? Not like the rest of us, but you'd better hope you never lay eyes on her. Where does she live? I asked. If I could find her, maybe I could persuade her to lift my curse. After all, Mandy could be wrong. We're not on speaking terms. I don't keep track of the whereabouts of Lucinda the idiot. Watch that bowl! The order came too late. I got the broom. <sighs> Are all friends clumsy? No, sweet. Fairy blood does not make you clumsy. That's human. You don't see me dropping plates, do you? I started to sweep, but it wasn't necessary. The pieces of pottery gathered themselves together and flew into the trash bin. I couldn't believe it. That's about all I do, honey. Small magic that can't hurt anybody. Handy sometimes, though. No sharp bits left on the floor. I stared into the bin. The shards lay there. Why didn't you turn it back into a bowl? The magic's too big. Doesn't seem like it, but it is. Could hurt someone. You never know. You mean fairies can't see the future? If you could, you'd know, wouldn't you? We can't see the future any more than you can. Only gnomes can. A few of them, anyway. A bell tinkled somewhere in the house. Father calling one of the servants. Mother never used the bell. Were you my great-grandmother's fairy godmother, too? A thousand questions flooded in. How long have you been our fairy godmother? How old was Mandy, really? Bertha came in. Sir Peter wants you in the study, miss. What does he want? I asked. He didn't say. She twisted one of her braids anxiously. Bertha was scared of everything. What was there to be afraid of? My father wanted to talk to me. It was only to be expected. I finished drying a plate. Dried another. Then a third. 
best not tarry, little mistress, Bertha said. I reached for a fourth dish. You'd better go, Mandy said, and he won't want to see that apron. Mandy was frightened, too. I took off the apron and left. I stopped just within the doorway of the study. Father sat in Mother's chair, examining something in his lap. "'Ah, oh, there you are,' he said. He looked up. "'Come closer, Ella.' I glared at him, resenting the order. Then I took one step forward. It was the game I played with Mandy, obedience and defiance. "'I asked you to come closer, Eleanor?' I came closer. Not near enough. I won't bite you. I only want to get to know you a bit. He walked to me and led me to a chair facing him. Have you ever seen anything as splendid as this? He passed me the object he'd had in his lap. You can hold it. It's heavy for its size. Here. I decided to drop it since he liked it so much. But I glanced at it first and then I couldn't. I held a porcelain castle, no bigger than my two fists, with six wee towers, each ending in a miniature candle holder. And oh, strung between a window in each of two towers was a gossamer thread of china, from which hung laundry, a man's hose, a robe, a baby's pinafore, all thin as a spider's web. And, painted in a window downstairs, a smiling maiden waved a silken scarf. It seemed to be silk, anyway. Father took it from me. Close your eyes. I heard him pull the heavy drape shut. I watched through slitted eyes. I didn't trust him. He placed the castle on the mantel, put in candles, and lit them. Open your eyes. I ran to look closer. The castle was a sparkling wonderland. The flames drew pearly tints out of the white walls, and the windows glowed yellow gold, suggesting cheerful fires within. Oh, I said. Father opened the drapes and blew out the candles. Lovely, isn't it? I nodded. Where did you get it? From the elves. An elf made it. They're marvelous potters. One of Agulin's students made this. I've always wanted an Agulin, but I hadn't got any yet. Where will you put it? Where do you want me to put it, Ella? In a window. Not in your room? In any room, but in a window. So it could wink out at everyone, inside and on the street. Father stared at me for a long moment. I shall tell its buyer to place it in a window. You're going to sell it? I'm a merchant, Ella. I sell things. For a minute he spoke to himself. And perhaps I can pass this one off as a genuine Agulin. Who could tell? He came back to me. Now you know who I am, Sir Peter the Merchant. But who are you? A daughter who used to have a mother. He waved that aside. But who is Ella? A lass who doesn't wish to be interrogated? He was pleased. You have courage to speak to me so. He looked me over. That's my chin. He touched it, and I drew back. Strong, determined. That's my nose. I hope you don't mind that the nostrils flare. My eyes, except yours, are green. Most of your face belongs to me. I wonder how it will be on a woman when you grow up. Why did he think it was fine to talk about me as though I were a portrait instead of a maiden? What shall I do with you? he asked himself. Why must you do something with me? I can't leave you to grow up a cook's helper. You must be educated. He changed the subject. What did you think of Dame Olga's daughters? They were not comforting, I said. 
Father laughed, really laughed, head back, shoulders heaving. What was so funny? I just liked being laughed at. It made me want to say something nice about the loathsome Hattie and Olive. They meant well, I suppose. Father wiped tears from his eyes. They didn't mean well. The older one is an unpleasant conniver like her mother, and the younger one is a simpleton. It never entered their heads to mean well. His voice became thoughtful. Dame Olga is titled and rich. What did that have to do with anything? Perhaps I should send you to finishing school with her daughters. You might learn how to walk like the slip of a thing you are and not like a small elephant. Finishing school? I'd have to leave Mandy. And they'd tell me what to do all the time, and I'd have to do it, whatever it was. They'd try to rid me of my clumsiness, but they wouldn't be able to. So they'd punish me. And I'd punish them back. And they'd punish me more. Why can't I just stay here? I suppose you could be taught by a governess if I could find someone. I would much rather have a governess, Father. I would study very hard if I had a governess. But not otherwise? His eyebrows rose, but I could tell he was amused. He stood and went to the desk where Mother used to work out our household accounts. You may go now. I have work to do. I left. On my way out, I said, Perhaps small elephants cannot be admitted to finishing school. Perhaps small elephants cannot be finished. Perhaps they... I stopped. He was laughing again. Chapter 4. We'll see you next time for Chapter 5.